guten tag good evening so uh, let me uh, commence the proceedings of our panel today that is on coastal cities and climate change and uh, to begin with uh, i would like to in introduce the experts who are there on our panel to begin with uh, professor dr holger shutrumpf a full professor at the rwth aachen university since 2007 has earlier been with the federal waterways engineering and research institute at hamburg from 2001 to 2007 and with the lightwise institute of hydraulics uh, technische universität braunschweig from 1993 to 2001 welcome professor shutram we look forward to uh, hearing from you then uh, the next person professor d parthasarathy a full professor in the department of humanities and social sciences at iit bombay since 2007 uh, beginning there of course in august 1997 has earlier been with the international crops research institute for the semi arid tropics at patancheru in andhra pradesh india from 1995 to 1997 welcome to you uh, professor parthasarathy our next expert is mr abhinash mohanty a program lead in the risks and adaptation team at the council on energy environment and water new delhi and has over 10 years of experience in evidence based policy research on climate change he is also a reviewer of the ipcc's sixth assessment report on impacts adaptation and vulnerability he is a member of the american geophysical union and his vocations include being a re radio jockey and creative producer so uh, that's a quite interesting uh, side aspect as for myself um, i am venkatrama sharma um, currently uh, leading the group on marine ecotoxicology here at the national center for coastal research in chennai uh, this is an attached office of the ministry of earth sciences government of india and uh, prior to uh, my current uh, vocation i was uh, in uh, the headquarters in new delhi uh, managing scientific research and development my uh, good fortune also uh, to be uh, a science diplomat at the embassy of india in berlin germany for 4 years from june 2011 to june 2015 and of course my passion is uh, microbiology i was associated with the eradication of polio from india uh, commencing my career in way back in 1989 uh, making the polio vaccine drops uh, in bulan shahar uttar pradesh so i think uh, uh, let us uh, get ahead with the proceedings today of our panel and uh, uh, what i would like to do is uh, you know um, share my screen which will uh, show you uh, what we uh, worked upon together the panelists so uh, i think all of you can uh, see my screen so this essentially our panel today is not looking at you know mind boggling geo engineering solutions that's not it what we want to do is basically look at the twin uh, grand challenges which are there ahead of us uh, be it coastal erosion storm surges sea level rise urban flooding we will also look at the other set of practical ideas be, be it community owned ideas localized solutions promising initiatives insights taken from research workable adaptations or should we be looking at transformation and all of this is connected with 
uh, essentially risk identification, identifying the precise risks that are involved and how we go about it. So uh, uh, now let me uh, request the first uh, speaker today to uh, take over the proceedings, Professor D. Parthasarathy. Uh, can I request you to please kick off the, uh, the proceedings? Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Venkatesh. Hello. Thank you so much, Mr. Sharma. Thank you also to all the other panelists. And thanks very much to uh, DWIH for inviting me to this very important and interesting uh, panel discussion. Uh, Mr. Sharma has already introduced me, so I will not spend more time on that. So I'm at IIT Bombay with a primary affiliation in uh, the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. But I'm also with the new program on climate studies. I was still recently the convener of this department. And I'm also associated with our Center for Urban Science and Engineering at IIT Bombay. And I'm happy to see a lot of uh, old friends also among the audience. And uh, I hope we have a fruitful discussion. So, um, yeah. So since my own primary research has been on Mumbai, let me start with that. Uh, a number of studies in recent years have shown that Mumbai is uh, among the top five cities in the world as the coast, one of the coastal cities in terms of exposure and vulnerability to different kinds of climate risks. And this is evident in the frequent flooding that happens in Mumbai almost annually during the monsoon season. The, there are a number of uh, emerging scenarios. Uh, you're not able to see the screen? Yeah. It's visible. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So uh, some of our uh, ongoing research on climate change and how it affects Mumbai uh, shows that uh, there's going to be increase in total accumulated annual rainfall with an increase in extreme precipitation events, which is more than 200 or 300 millimeters per day during the monsoon. Uh, it's higher incidence of vector borne diseases like malaria. Uh, we also have some studies in our own center which show that contrary to uh, uh, many of the previous studies, urbanization together with high uh, vegetation cover in Mumbai actually intensifies extreme rainfall events. And there is, of course, increased exposure to storm surge, tropical cyclones and sea level rise. Uh, what we also see is that because of the increasing urbanization, concretization, built up area, uh, several areas are experiencing urban heat island effects because of which there is variation in distribution of temperature and uh, extreme temperature and rainfall events within the city as well. And a number of studies have shown how the losses due to urban flooding and extreme events runs into several billions of dollars. And this is something that is uh, reflected in coastal cities around the world. Uh, again, a number of studies show that coastal cities around the world, which are among the most densely populated, extremely important for the economic growth of their countries and regions. These are highly vulnerable, not only to anthropogenic and climate hazards, but I've, as I've shown in one of my recent papers, these cities suffer from what I call as risk urbanism, where the nature of urban planning and development tends to marginalize, not just certain communities who are much more vulnerable, to disasters, but they tend to marginalize ecosystems, coastal wetlands, environmental habitats, which offer important protection against uh, silent intrusion, against the storm surge, uh, against tsunamis, uh, and against uh, sea level rise and coastal erosion. So uh, our, one of the projects that we are working on tries to look at these kinds of challenges in terms of um, how extreme events like extreme precipitation events, sea level rise, flooding, uh, these are affecting coastal cities. We have looking at three or four different coastal areas in India, but particularly Mumbai. And this project, which is called a tapestry project, which is a multi-country project um, involving partners from several countries and three different uh, locations across India and Bangladesh, um, funded by the Belmont Forum. Uh, we are looking at using this 
a particular approach, theoretical approach called transformation, which tries to go beyond adaptation to climate change. And I'll explain that in just a minute. Among the things that we are looking at, especially in Bombay, where you have a lot of fishing villages in the city and in the last larger metropolitan region, we're looking at different kinds of partnerships between government, NGOs, local communities and researchers to restore, protect mangroves. How can we reimagine coastal ecosystems, not merely in terms of livelihoods, which is very important, but also in terms of pollution control, in terms of protections they offer uh, from flooding. Um, we are trying to work with children and youth to develop more awareness about the importance of coastal ecosystems and wetlands for uh, uh, adapting to climate change. And uh, we're talking about how new urban planning models within uh, these coastal uh, resource-based communities and villages can help us to reimagine urban planning such that we can mitigate disaster risk reduction. Those who are more interested in this can go and visit this site and learn more about this on the Tapestry website. So this is the uh, broad uh, framework that we are using. And this is something that I would like to put forth to the participants here to discuss more. So uh, as you can see, on the one hand, you have different kind of climate extremes, uh, which create hazards, including urban floods. And on the left side below, we have the normal kind of adaptation measures, which we are proposing are quite inadequate, given both the severity of climate extremes, given the large scale environmental degradation, and given that there are huge governance failures in flood management. Therefore, we are trying to uh, uh, adopt this alternative approach of transformation, a more systemic change, both in processes as well as in larger issues related to urban development and planning, so that this transformative approach can address multiple factors which create vulnerabilities and risks to climate extremes. So essentially, it's a much more of a holistic approach that we are advocating here. So uh, we've identified a few vulnerable coastal areas of Mumbai. And like I was saying earlier, we're trying to reimagine urban planning from the perspective of uh, the coastal communities. We are saying that the livelihood protection of these communities depends on protection of the ecosystems and we are saying simultaneously this protection also offers risk mitigation from flooding and we are trying to do this through increased uh, role of citizens scientists government officials environmental uh, uh, activists in order to enhance uh, coastal well-being and among the things that we are particularly looking at is how to reduce flood risk mitigation through waste cleanup in coastal areas ecosystem uh, restoration in some of the fishing villages in the cities, recycling plastics to create more uh, useful uh, artifacts for the fishing communities. Uh, through a number of public interest litigations and uh, petitions, how do we enhance the protection to mangroves that's already been given by the High Court of Bombay and uh, help the mangrove cell of the Maharashtra government in its tasks. Uh, working with schools, school children and youth uh, and uh, using crowdsource GIS mapping to uh, enhance greater awareness about mangroves and their importance of flood risk mitigation and to act as local eyes and ears for uh, any violation of coastal regulation zones. And at the same time, uh, how can we address important issues of coastal infrastructure so that they don't yield adverse impacts, but they can uh, uh, have what are called as co-benefits in the climate change discourse. Yeah. So this, through this, we are trying to address issues of justice and equity, not simply as Mr. Sharma said, geotechnical or geoengineering issues, identifying that there are particular groups, ethnic groups, caste groups, social groups, urban poor, who are much more affected by urban flooding, trying to understand why these marginalized communities live in risky flood prone areas and then view these disasters as justice and equity issues so that there can be an urban planning process which not just reduces flood risk for the city at large but for those communities which are much more vulnerable so we are essentially saying that climate related disasters are refracted by 
discrimination and marginalization to yield particular kinds of vulnerabilities. Uh, so finally, I'd like to end with this to say that the challenges of uh, coastal urban governance uh, are not simply about uh, resilient infrastructure or about engineering solutions like seawalls um, uh, or cyclone shelters, but there are complex issues of urban governance which urgently need to address justice and equity issues so that there can be long-term sustainable and inclusive solutions to climate risks for coastal cities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Partha Sarathi, for effectively uh, pushing the transformation idea. I would now call upon uh, Abhinash Mohanty to take forward the proceedings. Thank you. Okay, I hope uh, my screen is visible. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Abhinash from Council on Energy, Environment and Water. So I'm going to tell you how Indian coast uh, can be prepared for extreme climate events, primarily mapping hotspots and response mechanisms. The Council on Energy, Environment and Water uh, is Asia's one of the leading not-for-profit policy research institution. The Council uses data integrated analysis and strategic outreach to explain and change the use, reuse and misuse of resources. Uh, 2020 started up with a flash floods in Indonesia, followed by a series of severe category cyclones along the eastern and western coast and ravaging floods in, that impacted hundreds of thousands across the Indian subcontinent. Since then, it has been a drumster fire year of talent risk, risk which have low probability but can be catastrophic. 2020 is a classic example of how a perfect storm looks like. Before deep diving into some of the findings that uh, we have been working on at the Council, let me set the context by stating that India is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world and globally it uh, is ranked among the fifth most vulnerable country and across South Asia is the 17th most vulnerable country in terms of long term vulnerability. India has already uh, suffered damages worth 5.6 lakh crores uh, in 300 plus climate extreme events since 2000 and uh, coming to the coastal chronic uh, divisions and the loss, uh, 36 million Indians are at risk of chronic flooding by 2050 due to sea level rise and coastal flooding. India has 12 major ports and 205 notified major and intermediate ports which accounts for 95% of the country's volume uh, of the trade and is exposed to coastal flooding and storm surges. At the same time, India has been a thought leader around the climate risk and on disaster risk reduction. India is a signatory to the Delhi Declaration on Emergency Preparedness and the Sandai Framework with other Southeast Asian countries which prioritize comprehensive risk assessments. This is an overview of the DRR governline, uh, governance timeline and as you can see that we have like enormous amount of energy been spent in terms of framing our disaster mandates as a country as well as for the global south primarily. Now comes the major portion. What exactly our coast look like? The state of extreme events across coastal uh, uh, coastal districts of India looks like uh, this. And this map, what I'm presenting is primarily a hotspot map. So CW carried out a first of its kind district level profiling of Indian climate extreme events by discussing the complexity and non of the trends and patterns. So the extreme events catalog that we prepared over a 50 year time scale from 1970 to 2019 through spatial and climatological modeling, a disaster district hazard assessment study was carried out. But before I deep down to the findings, let me tell you that we have also considered associated events. Uh, let me pause here and tell you what exactly an associated event is. When a cyclone occurs, cyclone is a couple of hours affair, but what it brings down is heavy rainfall and sometimes a lot more uh, of flooding can come in. So those prolonged associated events actually cause enormous impact in terms of loss and damages and we have also considered this loss and damages. So the map looks like 75% of the Indian districts are extreme events hotspots, but but 
the when we come down to the coastal districts, more than 95% of them are actually the extreme event hotspots. And more importantly, more than 50% of these uh, coastal districts are actually exposed to extreme floods or cyclone and its associated events. What is to our surprise, uh, not to our surprise, rather, India is also witnessing and primarily the coastal districts are witnessing an increasing, exponentially increasing trend across agricultural drought. That's sets the stage. The state of extreme event anomalies are also like more than 50% of the state, uh, districts are witnessing uh, cyclone plus flood, one or the other kind of hydrometeorological disasters and cyclone plus uh, drought is occurred or drought plus cyclone is occurred or flood plus drought is occurred and so on and so forth. Ideally, Eastern Coast, which witnesses cyclones uh, on a yearly basis is also seeing that the western courts are also increasingly witnessing the amount of cyclones in the near terms. Let's take a pause and spend some time on the anomalies. The map that I'm presenting currently is showing you that traditionally, which were the drought prone areas are becoming flood and the flood prone areas are becoming drought. And this is how uh, the climate uh, prediction. Of course, the climate uh, predicting climate is a very serious business, but understanding the compounding impacts is even more serious and complex. We tried analyzing the sifting pattern and uh, when it comes to the coastal districts, more than 69% of the coastal districts are showcasing a swapping trend. That is flood prone areas are becoming drought prone, drought prone are becoming flood prone and vice versa. And this is alarming. So basically, at uh, the seasonal onset, we would get, uh, we'll be getting prepared for a particular kind of disaster, but we will end up uh, witnessing a different kind of disaster. So what comes next? Hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. And that's why uh, we are going to present a 6i framework. A 6i framework, which starts up with identification. The identification of the risk and very precisely how Dr. Prathya Sarathi has also stated that and Dr. Venkat in his presentation is also going to present some of NCCR's work on identifying the risk. But what it needs is identifying the compounded impact and the associated events when I uh, just talk of it. The next in the cycle is inclusiveness. Climate resilience and climate proofing needs to be inclusive and all stakeholders need to be partnered with it and then comes innovations. When I say innovations, these are not technological innovations that I'm talking of. Technological innovations are part of it, but what we need is innovations around technology, at the same time, innovations around financing and innovation around systems. And to bring in those kind of innovations, we can, we need to reorient our thinking around innovations and this three kind of innovations are the need of the art. Once we have innovations in place, we need investment and investment also needs uh, which looks at averting loss and damage at a long term time frame and then the intervention. The intervention should be science based through empirical evidence uh, generation and then only we can climate proof our infrastructures and sectors. Then comes integration in India not to our surprise actually more than half a dozen of coastal zone frameworks are available governance frameworks are available and disaster risk reduction frameworks are available at the national level we also have around uh, from the climate fund the uh, uh, national action plan on climate change the state action plans on climate change but what is left blank is uh, the integration between all of these action plans the coastal uh, regulatory authorities or the coastal plans work in silos the climate action plans work in silos and the disaster plans work in silos so the integration is the need of the hour and with integration that can provide a budgetary fiscal provision as well. At the same time, development, practice, policy and outcomes can shape risk, but resilience can also be shaped by a proper realignment of thoughts. And that is why I present some of the key recommendations. First is developing a comprehensive climate risk atlas. Of course, NCCR has developed already a very robust, comprehensive uh, coastal risk atlas. But what I would urge is not just looking at long-term scenarios, but at short-term scenario. What is going to happen now and then in five years from now should be uh, known, at least should be indicatively known with a layering of the climate, uh, climate logical variables that have been happening at the long term. At the same time, 
we should also consider some of these uh, long-term scenarios with the short-term framing by understanding the associated impacts of climate resilience. As a first step, we need to understand and develop this climate risk atlas covering critical vulnerabilities such as coast, urban heat stress, water stress, crop loss, vector bond disease, and biodiversity collapse. A coastal zone atlas, which already uh, Dr. Venkat uh, and his team has be, will be presenting, uh, in fact, they have prepared at the NCCR, will also need some of this real-time information to be integrated into it and uh, the early warning systems that have been put into place. Then comes, uh, once you map those vulnerabilities, you basically develop an integrated emergency surveillance system, which is systemed, uh, systemic, sustained, and response uh, which can provide response to emergencies. And the IESM should be structured as a real-time system that provides information on all kinds of shocks, uh, whether those are climate shocks or natural shocks or extreme climate shocks, all of those information should be there and should be targeted to concerned authorities, citizens, and providing constant updates in the response and relief efforts. Then comes, which is the most important pillar and of, often like we overlook it, that's the participatory engagement. The ambient of climate risk assessment should involve public policy functionaries, financial, uh, financial and insurance partners. It should also include industry partners. Apart from the, uh, apart from the scientists uh, who are working on climate risk, this should actually go around the mandate of risk informed planning at different levels. And it is more importantly, it should include participatory from the communities because they hold the key to traditional practices and to nature based solutions, which can be very effective and are the low hanging fruits. Then finally is the integrating climate risk assessments. As I have already said that it needs to be integrated into our NAPCCs, SFECCs, uh, coastal, uh, subnational and uh, regional as well as uh, uh, disaster risk management plans as well as to coastal plans. And then finally we should need to develop traditional uh, because what is happening is once all of these are integrated where will the money be coming in? and the money that we require is actually going to come in from customized telemate risk financing instruments and this risk financing instruments should actually uh, be uh, be telemate in terms of regions and context and should have uh, need to be integrated into the national adaptation funds into the regional adaptation funds and should require uh, some of the global and regional and can also be integrated into the regional and global risk pools. Uh, presenting some of our partners who have been working with us and we are really thankful to them. Uh, before I conclude my presentation, our analysis, whatever I have presented is actually a 0 0.6 degree rise implication. Global, regional, national and subnational climate actions are actually geared up towards limiting uh, to a further increase of the Earth's temperature, breaching the two degree threshold will have major consequences on the planet and people. But the question is, are they enough? And this question needs to be answered thoroughly. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Looking forward to having a, a stimulating conversation. And thank you to IGF. Wishing you all to stay resilient and safe. Thank you, Abhinash, uh, for your presentation. I will now uh, commence with uh, what the National Center for Coastal Research is uh, doing. And uh, essentially, you know, all of us know that beach erosion is a chronic problem uh, amongst the many uh, of the co uh, coastal populations who have this uh, major risk that is facing them. And uh, what we need is for, uh, you know, both accurate information regarding uh, the rate of shoreline movement as well as uh, regarding past as well as present trends in this area. And with this in mind, uh, NCCR carried out a study on shoreline change along the mainland of India. As you can see in the slide um, from beginning from 1990 onwards, and we came out with a shoreline atlas uh, in uh, 2016 on 27th July uh, 2018 this report was released and uh, what we can see is that India has uh, over 7500 kilometers long coastline and many coastal cities are facing severe erosion and uh, 
this uh, is essentially you know west bengal the state of west bengal there is 63 percent is the erosion level in puducherry 57 percent in the state of kerala 45 percent and in tamil nadu 41 percent of the coast uh, is where the erosion has exceeded 40 percent and on the other hand in the states of odisha and andhra pradesh odisha 51 percent and 42 percent of uh, accretion has been noticed 40 more than 40 percent accretion so just a small nugget of information is that you know uh, west bengal coast has lost about 99 square kilometers of land during the last 26 years so this shows the gravity of the issue and uh, our entire uh, coastline has been mapped in one is to 25000 uh, uh, scale about 526 maps are there and uh, this is to identify vulnerable coastal areas along with district maps and state maps and these are being updated each year so this is what uh, uh, exactly is being done and with this we hope to uh, tackle uh, coastal er erosion practically especially in coastal cities like chennai vishakhapatnam goa kanyakumari mahabalipuram puri sundarbans etc so uh, next i would come to the other activity of the center is we have uh, undertaken uh, you know uh, urban flood warning system uh, in coastal cities of both chennai as well as uh, mumbai i'll talk about the megapolis of mumbai which is also the financial hub of india so uh, you can see essentially that this is uh, a entire module based approach there are totally seven modules in this the data assimilation model module the flood module the inundation module the vulnerability module the risk module and the dissemination module so uh, what this uh, first one does the data assimilation module is basically it gathers dynamic data includes the weather forecast from the india meteorological department underwater depth of rivers and lakes across mumbai city so essentially meteorological hydrological and thematic layers comprise the first one and then the flood module will predict how uh, exactly the water will move across the areas that are expected to be flooded so we have got the uh, levels uh, of uh, land in the various uh, coastal uh, coastal uh, low lying areas and subsequently the vulnerability and risk modules that together comprise the decision support system helps enable the administration to take smart decisions to manage the situation based on a scientific and holistic assessment of the flooding risk so you can see that uh, each of these basically the inundation you have got historical maps model based real time and uh, uh, for the risk module you can see that the matrix the risk matrix that maps the hazard and the vulnerability to the risk is there and finally the dissemination module utilizes a variety of tools tables sms's audio as well as risk maps so that's how it is and this is what was done uh, when there was extremely heavy rainfall on the 5th and 6th of august last year so we have uh, you can see from the colors various colors in the map the uh, amount of uh, risk post low moderate and high and basically it gives flood guidance as well as the uh, impact bound boundary forecast so uh, i would now uh, just state that uh, you know uh, mumbai uh, iflows the uh, integrated flood warning system 
uh, not only takes into account uh, heavy precipitation that is extreme uh, rain uh, weather event but also factors in tidal waves and storm tides for its flood assessments and it taps on field data from 120 rain gauges and uh, this uh, essentially uh, helps to relay alerts of possible flood prone areas anywhere between 6 to 72 hours in advance so 3 to 6 hours in advance is both now costing as well as forecasting both is being done and both of these models in chennai as well as in mumbai are operational and in mumbai it has been done with in collaboration in partnership with the uh, greater uh, mumbai municipal corporation uh, with this i conclude my presentation and uh, request professor uh, shutram to please take this forward thank you so much yeah thank you very much for your kind introduction mr venkat and thank you very much also for giving me the possibility to present something on or give a short, short talk on coastal cities and climate change. Um, my name is Holger Schüttrumpf and I'm head of the Institute of Hydraulic Engineering and Water Resources Management of Aachen University. So for those of you who don't know Aachen, um, we are somewhere in the extreme west of Germany, very close to the Netherlands and Belgium. So I would like to give a talk on coastlines and cities. And so why do I want to speak on coastal cities? Yeah, if you see this slide on especially the right part of the slide. Uh, okay, we are not interested maybe in, in flash floods, but we are interested in, for example, tropical storms or earthquakes, tsunamis. We are interested in storm surges. And as you can see on this slide, the most affected areas are in the coastal zone. So that means coastal zones yeah, a uh, very important area, especially concerning, for example, also the impacts of climate change. And that's why I think we have to focus on what happens in the coastal zone and, of course, with a, with a focus on the coastal cities. Okay, um, I would like to present something on change. Um, of course, in the title of the presentation, we have already coastal cities and climate change, but we have multiple changes. We have not only coastal change, we have also land use change. We have a change of processes. We have a change of risk and all this kind of things. And that's what we have to take into account when we would think about future strategies, future methods, future possibilities. And of course, we have to learn somehow from the past. We have to consider what happens nowadays and what is going on in the future. And that's why I think change is a very important topic, a very important word in this context. So as already started, um, yeah, coasts are very dynamic areas. Um, you'd see just here a single slide. I could show you um, many, many photos on, on coastal areas. And coastal areas are due are are changed all the time. And when you go to the coastline, coastline, what you see there, that is a product of millions of years of change. So what means we have natural changes and these natural changes are due to the processes at the coastlines. So we speak about tidal dynamics, we speak about storm surges, currents, waves, sediment transport and morphodynamics. And all these processes resulted in the formation of the coastlines um, as we see them today. And that means the first change we have is a coastal change, the, the, the normal coastal change. And we, as coastal engineer, I'm a coastal engineer, we have to work in these areas, um, which are subject to yeah, strong, even strong natural changes. And these strong natural changes are superimposed by yeah, the effects, the impacts of climate change. And climate change leads also to a coastal change, in addition to what we have as a natural process. So again, we speak about, so what is the impact of climate change, of course, on sea level rise? So the, the photo you see here, the slide you see here, that shows you the, the sea level rise during the last uh, century. So, for example, in Germany, we speak about the, an observed sea level rise of something about 25 to 30 centimeter during the last 100 years. And we speak about something like 50 to 1 meter during the next 100 years. But sea level rise is not just one process. 
um, which is impacted by climate change. We have also impacts on other processes. Due to sea level rise, tidal dynamics are changed. Storm surges will be changed. Not only the height, but also the intensity, the frequency, that is also something which is changed by sea level rise and the impacts of climate change. And that results also in a change of currents, in a change of waves, sediment transport and morphodynamics again. So climate change leads or superimposes the natural changes and we have an additional change due to climate change. And then coastlines are very populated areas. And that is also an aspect which is very important to be considered. So if you see, we had something about 1 billion people on this world in 1800. Nowadays, we have about 7.5 billion people in the world. And most of these people are, uh, something around 66% of the people are living in coastal areas. So coastal areas here defined as less than 300 kilometers from the coastline. Something around 625 millions of people are living in an area which is lower than 10 meter. And lower than 10 meters, that means these areas are affected by storm surges, typhoons, hurricanes, tsunamis, etc. And then if you think, where are the, 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 the agglomerations the, with more than something like 10 million people? So that's what we call mega cities. Then we find 14 out of 21 mega cities are located in the coastal zone. And then people live very close to the zone. So that's what I show you here on this, this photo. This is a photo of Chennai. I have been there about two years ago. And I think this, this photo is quite uh, representative what happens in the coastal zone. We have quite a lot of activities, um, human activities in the coastal zone. And that means we, this results in an exchange, in a change of vulnerabilities. And then, of course, me as a coastal engineer, I'm not only interested in what happens uh, here on the, on the left side. So this is a photo of the island of Norderney. Um, for, of course, the left side photo that is during summer, it's nice there. You can go bathing and it's very nice to be in the sun there. But we as coastal engineers, we are more focusing on what you see on the right hand photo. So this is a storm surge event in 1706, exactly the same place. But you see, um, it is very dangerous to go out in this area. And that's why we are interested in, in coastal zones and what we have to do. We have to protect people. We have to protect environment. We have to protect all our activities. And then we are at the next change. So what I showed you, we have a change of the coastal hazards, change in intensity, frequency, and so on. We have, that's what I showed you also, we have a change of the expected damage, the expected vulnerability. And if I combine both, so the multiplication of coastal hazards and expected danger, uh, damage, that results in an increased risk. So that means we have also a change of risk. And if you go into literature, you will find that maybe the, um, an event with a, a return interval of 100 years during the last 100, uh, during the last 100 years will be an, an event with a return interval of maybe 80 or 70 years in the future. So that means we have a change of risk. But we have also other changes in the coastal zone. And especially we have changes in the coastal environment. I don't want to focus too much on this aspect. So we speak about coastal erosion, salinity intrusion, coastal pollution, drainage problems, and loss of bio biodiversity. All these are problems in the coastal zone. And in many cases, especially um, coastal cities are affected. So what can we do? In coastal engineering, we have especially two possibilities um yeah to face these problems um one of the problem is in many cases flood protection so we have to protect against flooding due to um typhoons hurricanes storm surges but also tsunamis and we in many cases we have to do something against coastal erosion so we speak about co uh, erosion protection 
Um, the problem is that we have also another, uh, some other coastal challenges to be uh, considered. We live in a world of economic pressures. So you have to convince people to yeah, spend money for coastal protection, for example. We are in a, in, a, in, a, in a time of uncertainties because we don't know exactly what will be the next storm surge, what will be the height of the next storm surge. I also spoke about reduced finances. So who is interested to spend money on coastal protection, even if this might be uh, necessary? We speak about the decrease of resources and increasing population. And that means from research, we need the development of new and innovative inter interdisciplinary strategies, which is mandatory for sustainable use of the coastal zone due to the many users of the coastal zone, because we as coastal engineers, we are not alone in the coastal zone. And that's what you see maybe on the photos in the, in the background here. Um, we have also our ports in the coastal zone. We have offshore wind energy. We have nature conser conservation, we have the industry, we have the fishery, and so on and so on. So um, that is a point which is of, uh, yeah, of importance for the coming decades. So the main challenge for coastal protection, especially in, in the coastal zone and for coastal cities, is climate adaptation. And that is the task of the, of the hour which means we have to adapt our coastline um, and we need something like a sustainable coastal protection. And therefore, we have a number of tasks to be considered. So for example, we have to understand the changes and not only climate change, but also the change, the natural change, the change of the vulnerabilities and the change of the risk. In the next step, we need a sustainable coastal management. We need coastal structures, coastal solutions, which are adaptive, because what we don't know exactly for the future is, we don't know the situation, for example, in the year 2100. And when we do something today, we have already to integrate what will be the future, maybe in 80 or 70 years. And that means we should not focus on fixed structures, structures which are unable to adapt, but we have also to think about adaptive coastal structures or adaptive coastal solutions. And that means we have to think more about life cycle engineering or life cycle management. And I would uh, start or I would like to focus also on one aspect, which is quite modern at the moment, which is regarded to nature based solutions. So coming away from gray fixed coastal structures more towards um, green coastal solutions. And that means we need also a change of coastal engineering. We need a change of our philosophies, of our strategies, of our structures. And that is the next topic, which is, re which is related to change. So I, I just, uh, yeah, showed in green um, that we need nature-based solutions. And I would like to show you some of the photos about our coastlines. Coastlines can be very beautiful, but in many cases, Coastlines are quite gray and they are fixed and we don't find any nature. So, for example, on this photo, or if you show you another photo, um, that the first photo was from Taiwan. This is a photo from, from Germany and you see there is no, no green, no nature um, along the coastline. And then the third one, this is from the Netherlands which is one of the most important storm surge barriers of the Netherlands. And here where I'm standing, um, Sea Dyke, which is protecting the hinterland. But again, this is gray. And the question is, where is nature? Um, so what we have and what we use in many cases along our coastlines are gray coastal structures. So for example, sea dikes, um, breakwaters, groins, um, revetments and other structures. And we know the advantages of this, what I call gray coastal structures. But we know also that all these gray coastal structures have also some unintended, unintended effects. So some disadvantages. And that's something we know not nowadays, we know it even for many decades. 
So that means, of course, we know very well how to design these structures. We know their functions and we know how to optimize these structures. But we know also that we are unable to adapt uh, gray coastal structures. Um, we know that they have some impacts on the coastal environment and we know that they will weaken over the time. Um, so that means we have to maintain the structures. And that's a, that are some of the main problems. And at the end, this is very cost expensive. So for example, if I think about coastal engineering or coastal protection in the Netherlands, then I speak about something like 1.6 billion euro per year until the year 2050, just to protect one single country like the Netherlands. And if I speak about the global costs, so for example, there is a, a reference by Hinkle et al. in 2014 that I speak about something, and that is again, I think per year, something in between 12 and 71 billion euro or dollar um, until the year 2100, what we have to spend on coastal protection. And that means we have to think about other possibilities. And we have to think, think especially about, yeah, how can we develop adaptive structures? How can we face these problems of great coastal structures? And there's a point, we have already these structures. Um, that is not really new, but uh, we see that we have uh, a growing interest in this kind of structures. So here I have yeah, given a, a headline from gray to green. So which means we have to move from only using great uh, coastal infrastructures to using soft or green coastal infrastructures. And that is one of the main challenges. I don't want to tell you that we should replace all of our gray coastal structures by soft infrastructures, but we have to think, think more about what is possible and do we need um, concrete structures at any point or can we use soft solution at at uh, at this point as well. That is one of the challenges. And um, we have a number of research projects, uh, not only at my institute, but also at other institutes worldwide, about how can we yeah, grow the interest uh, in this nature-based solutions. Because what we see, we see, we see some advantages of nature-based solutions. So they are more environmental friendly. They can be adaptive especially if we think about all the uncertainties we still have concerning climate change and the consequences and impacts of climate change. They are self-sustaining, they are more economic, and they have also some additional benefits to coastal protection. Um, so this is something like the natural environment. I would like to give you some examples of, we call them ecosystem engineers. And we call it also ecosystem services. So if we can use these ecosystem engineers um, in the context of coastal protection, then this is called ecosystem services. So for example, we speak about dunes, mangroves, tidal marsh plants, seagrasses, and so on and so on. That is something which is already available. But the problem is the understanding and the knowledge on their functions concerning coastal protection, so flood protection and erosion protection is less compared to our classical coastal structures. Okay, so which are the main challenges for nature-based solutions? We have some general requirements, so we need enough space. We have to think about longer time frames because just imagine something like a mangrove or seagrass, they need some time to develop. Um, we need a societal and political acceptance because especially when we speak about time, we need time. Um, and that is yeah, not related to something like election periods. Okay, um, so we have a number of projects here. For example, the most important coastal structure in, in Germany is a sea dike and um, we still want to protect the people, that is the main focus. But in the, se on the, se in the same, um, at the same moment, we also want to, yeah, give more green to the structures. 
So that is a point which is really interesting. And that is also related to yeah, the topic of, of course, of my, my lecture here. And you see that is, you find it even in, in newspapers at the moment. I, I have the impression that someone is also clicking here in my presentation. Um, so I have to bring you back. So I would like to come to a short uh, summary and some conclusions. So what I showed you is climate change will particularly affect coastal cities. And that is also due to the change of the coastal hazards. Coastal flooding and coastal erosion will threaten millions of people and they cost, will cost trillions of dollars. And that's why we have to, to think about this aspect. Um, I showed you that great coastal structures are unable to adapt to changing environmental conditions. They can just act as they have been designed, but not more. And that's why Coastal adaptation is one of the challenges of the future. And we have to focus coastal research on coastal adaptation. And we have to focus coastal research on nature-based solutions. Nature-based solutions will play a pivotal role in a new coastal strategy. Yeah, and finally, yeah, climate change has already started. And I think there is no, no, not a similar area in the world where we can see climate change as good as in the coastal zone because especially from the sea level rise we know that we have a change in climate and we therefore we have a change of sea level and that's why we have to start with coastal adaptation not in the future we have to start with coastal adaptation nowadays and that is the end of my talk thank you very much for your attention thanks Thanks a lot, Professor Shutram, uh, for an excellent uh, talk that brought the uh, European context to this uh, forum. And uh, all expert speakers here today have done an excellent job, uh, beginning with uh, Professor Parthasarathy, who spoke about the importance and of building partnerships as key to this uh, bringing about transformation and uh, you know the essentially for calling for new urban pl planning models models that would re reduce disaster risks as well as adverse impacts and uh, um, common thread in uh, all the talks was you know how uh, you know for example professor shutram spoke about the drainage problem that is uh, you know man made and uh, so we need uh, solutions that address both processes as well as larger systemic issues and that was uh, flagged by uh, mohanti as well who uh, stated how we could prepare for such things with the 6 i framework of atlas surveillance engagement, integration uh, of uh, risk assessment and action plans in investments backed by investments and appropriate interventions. So thank you each one of you for uh, this uh, fantastic uh, uh, series. Now uh, for the expert panel, a couple of questions. Uh, before we take the questions that have been submitted by the participants. So uh, one question that I would like to uh, put to Professor Shutram is uh, regarding the drainage problem. Do you think that uh, this is a failure of urban waste management, essentially? Professor Shutram, please. So um, urban drainage, especially in coastal engineering, will become a, uh, a significant problem probably in the future. So if you think about sea level rise, so water is going up and then you have to drain coastal cities and some of the coastal cities are just slightly above sea level rise. Then of course, um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to discharge the water. And um, probably that could result in something that we need more pumping stations uh, to discharge the water. <laughs> so I remember I had a project in, in Mozambique and uh, in the city of Beira, and there it was a real problem how to how to drain the city. 
because the city is very, very low. And um, if sea level rise is going up, and that was a problem in, in that city, then it's very difficult to get water out. And that means um, many areas will get wet and that has yeah, additional problems. Thank you for that uh, very uh, good example of uh, Mozambique, which you uh, uh, showed how exactly it is a significant issue. Thank you so much. Uh, Another uh, uh, question I would like to uh, uh, ask uh, Mr. Mohanty to uh, throw some light upon is uh, can this 6i framework fit uh, nature based solutions as well? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Venkat. Uh, I mean, uh, to be very honest, uh, the 6i framework is actually adopted from traditional and nature-based practices, to be very honest. Uh, because whatever our practices are, if you, if you look at the Sandai framework for disaster risk reduction, then uh, it primarily states about identification of risk, understanding of risk, investing in risk, and then uh, bringing about a participatory changes. Uh, if you go down to any of those community level practices that you see, it also includes all of this. The only thing that we lack is a structured cohesiveness where all the stakeholders actually come down together. So 6i framework is basically is not just a rocket science that I'm presenting. It's already been there. What we are trying to do is trying to integrate and come across all of this uh, I, in, in a more cohesive way, if we can just uh, put it together and bring about a change not just in the system of uh, our thinking but also in the way of how we perceive risk uh, at the same time i mean a uh, year from uh, in 2019 none of us would have ever thought of actually witnessing a pandemic but we adjusted and we adjusted very fastly and that's what we are made of we can adapt to changes but these changes need to be cohesive sustainable and which and whatever decisions we take need to be climate proof. That's where the 6i framework comes in. So it can basically fit into nature-based solutions and in fact, to all those sustainable solutions across the uh, journal. Yeah. I hope I could answer your question. Thank you, Mohanty, for throwing light. Uh, now, uh, Professor Parthasarathy, my uh, uh, simple uh, question, but I think it will need a slightly long answer. Um, these uh, transformative uh, things, not just adaptation, which you spoke about, how can you make or rather build partnerships which are key that will work in our coastal cities? Thank you, Professor Parthasarathy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Sharma. Uh, in fact, that is at the core of the approach of transformation as well. And uh, what we are doing is to produce what is called as co-production of knowledge. So the transformation approach um, incorporates knowledge production for action, which is co-produced, which is a term that's come from science technology studies, especially from the work of Sheila Jasanoff at Harvard. So the partnerships are built in the process of research for designing strategies. So we try, for example, when it comes to mangrove protection, the knowledge about the mangroves, like both uh, Mr. Mohanty and Professor uh, Shutram have said, they need natural solutions, they need traditional knowledge, they need indigenous knowledge. We also need scientists, we need environmental activists to change the laws, we need governments to make sure that the laws are implemented. So the understanding of the problem and the design of solutions are done in this uh, through this method of co-production of knowledge, which then translates into several stakeholder meetings. Again, we are uh, we are uh, innovating specific uh, methodologies for these stakeholder meetings so in association with the All India Disaster Management Institute in Ahmedabad, which is which converts these this co-produced knowledge into action strategies that uh, 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 the, on which there is consensus. So that we can go ahead and implement them. That's the short answer. But as you mentioned, it will require, require a much longer answer. But it, so essentially, it's required. It's related to the way in which we produce knowledge and design strategies. 
professor partha sarathi so nicely put i uh, would therefore sum up our uh, whole discussions today as uh, like professor shutram said change is the only constant in coastal areas that has been happening over millions of years and that uh, what is the key is that nature based solutions would uh, play a pivotal role in devising new coastal strategies for all of us and uh, i think now uh, we can uh, take uh, uh, some of the questions that have been put forth by the participants so uh, one of them from aishwarya pradeep reads uh, and here i request uh, any of the panelists to just jump in she asks what are the mitigation options to avoid more coastal erosion uh, and uh, what adaptation strategies can be taken to protect livelihoods of fisher folk so any one of you i can i can do it if you like so especially the first part of the question not the part on the livelihoods of the fisher fisher folk communities but the first part so i think you very well summarized uh, what i told so you you said uh, changes the only constant in coastal areas and if i think about coastal erosion so i think the first point is we have to accept coastal erosion so coastal erosion is nothing new it is not only induced by humans it is also a natural process so that is the first point second is in some cases of course we are concerned by coastal erosion so we would like to avoid coastal erosion then we have to think about what is the origin what is the purpose of uh, uh, coastal erosion so what i found in some areas um, the cause of coastal erosion is quite far away so i would mention for example our reservoirs um, so we have uh, sedimentation in our reservoirs and maybe you might say okay what is the problem but i would like to give you two examples so one example is the nile delta so in the nile delta we have 25 meter of retreat of the coastline per year in the mekong delta another nice example we have 50 meters of coastal retreat per year so if you think about 100 over 100 years so we speak of something about 2.5 kilometer or 1.5 kilometer of coastal retreat that is significant so that means we have to think what is the cause of coastal erosion then the third aspect is um and you you remember maybe my my photo from the coastline of of chennai um we have to accept the distance from the coastline because the coastline is a very active zone, um, which means um, building structures or starting human activities really on the coastline, that is not a good idea because, yeah, someone as, uh, at any point you might be impacted, uh, you might have, there might have been, uh, there might be an impact of the coastal processes. So, and when you have already s s talked or discussed all these points and still you you see it's relevant to protect then you have to think about um, what are the main possibilities for coastal protection and then we speak about um, sea walls coral reefs or um, artificial reefs um, planting seagrass and so on but first we have to think what is the cause of coastal erosion and then we can think about how can we can we face coastal erosion so again nice example um, i have been involved in many projects in vietnam and the main problem in vietnam is coastal erosion in the mekong delta and people try to do something about, against coastal erosion and the natural possibility is building mangro or planting mangroves but the, pro the main problem is the cause is upstream the Mekong and not really in the coastal zone. So that means coastal erosion is a problem with many, many faces and we have to carefully protect our coastline. Can I also come in briefly? Sure. Yeah, yeah, please, please. So the first part, you know, about uh, what kind of measures coral reefs he was process should Trump has already addressed so I won't go into that about the adaptation strategies to protect the livelihoods essentially there are multiple uh, 
uh, aspects here also uh, just like in coastal erosion so you do need coastal wetland protection protection of mangroves the marine biodiversity on all of these uh, they depend on for livelihoods these are also spaces where different species of fish crustaceans they come and breed so the protection of these habitats are very important for livelihoods um, but also um, adaptation uh, is important from the perspective of flood mitigation because the livelihoods are also affected by uh, floods by salinity intrusion in this uh, coastal for these coastal fish folk communities as we are studying in uh, you know several villages across maharashtra so it's both disaster prevention and protection of the coastal uh, uh, lands uh, as well as the marine biodiversity about whether there are model town cities which have tackled this very well so we are uh, uh, um, um, we know already that there are uh, many villages um, which have this natural protection either through mangroves or through dunes or through other kinds of vegetation natural solutions both in west bengal and in odisha as well as in tamil nadu where the ms swaminathan research foundation has done some work on this so in last 2 3 years there has been significant documentation that whenever there is a cyclone or a storm surge um, villages which this kind of uh, natural uh, protection have actually been um, ha had better uh, uh, protection uh, from storm surge uh, from tidal inundation and so on compared to those where there has been significant uh, uh, coastal wet and loss uh, and that is we are trying to learn lessons from these and then implement those in some of the coastal fishing villages in maharashtra as well as uh, like a few villages in kadlur district of tamil nadu where we are trying to implement this Thank you so much uh, now for another question that has been posed by gs chauhan uh, i think uh, mohanti can uh, uh, take a call on this uh, does the development imperative sideline climate change concerns in coastal regions and specifically referring to the recent changes in the uh, coastal regulatory zone uh, laws mohanti thank you thank you uh, thank you mr chauhan for putting forward this question uh, i'll not get into the nut and bolts of crz rules uh, because a lot of debate has been happening of late uh, but what i would say is when climate change occurs it doesn't occur across uh, a particular geography uh, it doesn't have any boundary to basically expose people uh, people across the coastal region even during uh, what i presented is uh, both the western coast and eastern coast and not just in india all of this have neighboring countries where people are completely exposed so now we need to get out of the framework of geographical boundaries and doing climate actions within geographical boundaries of a particular country state or uh, of a district we need to go beyond that we need to start having this conversations at regional level uh, a flood in bihar actually affects people uh, out there in nepal so you need to have a nepal bihar kind of connection to get into the uh, myopex what you have referred into the study uh, in your question primarily that uh, you need to have that approach to basically address some of this resilient uh, building practices and then only this can become inclusive because human lives matter everywhere and ecosystems do matter but what basically it has to be done is to look at from a not just from a myopic view but from a toad's eye view what we call it as not just from a bird's eye view i hope i could answer mr chauhan your question mohanti uh, i think uh, one last question from the participants uh, posed by simi mehta goes uh, like this uh, could the panelists reflect upon the climate uh, refugees and issue and migration from coastal cities so uh, uh, what kind of impacts should policy research bring while studying climate migration uh, maybe if i can give a try to this question and i'm sure my fellow panelists would have something to add uh, i would start while while we look at disasters we often look at disasters or climate extremes from a very siloed approach i mean we look at them as a single event we never look at them at a, as a combined 
system which is trying to basically derail our uh, livelihood system. So first thing is we need to look at them from a, a complex system that is happening because climate change, whatever is happening is not just a phenomenon of temperature rise or precipitation change. It has got the whole physics and the atmospheric sciences combined together. And of course, our anthropocentric actions uh, uh, compounding the impacts. So first is uh, if we if it start looking climate change from the perspective of compounded impacts and look at them from the approach of uh, uh, the loss and damage that has been caused often whatever loss and damage is reported is the hard loss and damages and same goes uh, just to give you an example uh, whenever a flood comes we don't have enough uh, relief structures or relief houses uh, where people can actually evacuate and stay down. I mean, I mean, the shelter homes are not adequate. So what we do is we use our uh, public infrastructures like schools, colleges and everything. And that's where we see uh, a lot of school days been lost. So we need to counter those soft losses into our calculation and uh, then look at the loss of livelihood. It's not just that the amount of crop productivity that has been lost, but at the same time, the number of mandates, those are affected. Already there are studies where which showcases not just to coastal area, but primarily India is going to lose a quantum of its productivity hours because of its stress. Now, where does this number come in? And we are primarily a youth uh, oriented country. All of us are quite young energetic we are striving to work forward but if we lose our productivity hours because of climate change where do we stand so the first approach of any public policy research should not just look at the impacts from a siloed approach you need to integrate them and that's where probably the 6i framework comes in handy the second thing is whenever you are calculating the impacts you should not look at it from a siloed approach uh, i hope i could uh, throw some light over to my fellow panelists uh, thank you, Mr. Mohanty. I just have a very quick point to add. Uh, I you know, completely agree with you that we have to look at it from a complex systems perspective and not just look at it in silos. And uh, this is something that was highlighted even in the slides of Professor Shutruv, because the coastal cities around the world, like I mentioned, are some of the most densely populated. Uh, they are engines of growth. And therefore, um, while it's important to look at climate migration from coastal cities, what we need to recognize is that class, coastal cities attract millions of migrants from other parts uh, of countries and regions, uh, which uh, uh, are affected by uh, problems of economic growth, but also more importantly, uh, uh, climate change related impacts like droughts, water crisis, um, frequent flooding, they push people more towards coastal cities. So when coastal cities are affected by extreme events, they affect not just the people who are natives of that area, but also a significant proportion of migrants. Like we saw recently in India during the pandemic, when uh, you know, millions of people, especially from coastal cities, started migrating back to their villages. So we have to look at it in terms of the complex patterns of demographic migration across different regions, which are affected by both human socioeconomic factors as well as by climate related impacts. Fantastic. Uh, Professor Shutra, any concluding remarks? Just just a few words to, to, to add. I think uh, Professor Patasarati has already uh, mentioned everything. So what we have is more, we have a migration towards coastal cities and not the migration away from coastal cities. I think coastal uh, cities are very attractive for, for many, many people. And that is, of course, in many cases, because they have jobs in, in coastal cities. And that makes, uh, the result is again that um, the risk of coastal cities um, is increasing. Um, so if you think uh, that's what I showed, risk is combination of vulnerability, uh, vulnerability and probability of hazards. Then, of course, the vulnerability is increasing. The more people we have in the coastal cities and the higher the economic value in the coastal cities is. Thank you, Professor Shutram. Uh, so it's my honor to, uh, you know, chair this uh, session of uh, esteemed uh, experts in each and every uh, domain. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, 
conclude with a small message which is also a request to all participants who have taken advantage of this particular session please go and visit the virtual booth and uh, here you can see the work being carried out by different research institutions both from germany as well as india and you uh, it's surprising you know what you don't know and what you might discover that will be useful for you and uh, second take home is that uh, these panel discussions will be available for completely one whole month online so please take fullest advantage of this and uh, feel free to uh, go through this uh, talks in your leisure time thank you each and every one and i would like to also thank uh, dwih especially uh, ms jam khedkar as well as uh, um, uh, ms katya lash for this excellent uh, opportunity to be here and uh, bring all of you together on this uh, platform of meet you thank you so much you too bye 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 and see you next time yeah choose